Well, a very warm welcome to you to our morning service at Ashbourne Baptist Church. My name is Tim Blower and I'm standing in today for our Pastor Nathan. We're a small independent evangelical reformed Baptist church of about 20 members that was started about 15 years ago. We normally meet in the Empire Hall, an old cinema, in the middle of the small picturesque market town of Ashbourne in Derbyshire in the UK. Ashbourne is famed for its Shrovetide football and for being the gateway to the Peak District National Park. Although churches are now allowed to meet under restricted conditions, the Empire Hall is not yet open for any activities, and so for the moment we're still meeting virtually. We pre-record elements of the morning service for broadcasting, that's what I'm doing at the moment, we're broadcasting on a Sunday morning and then meet on Zoom on Sunday and Thursday evenings. If you'd like to meet with us on Zoom from wherever you are in the world, we'd be very happy to hear from you. You can find more details of our church and how to contact us through our website at www.ashbournebaptist.org. You can also find that link in the YouTube description. I'll also try and put the scripture passages referred to in the talk later in the YouTube description. Well, as we come to worship God this morning, let's start with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you this morning to worship you. We're coming, uh, sitting in different places, but we come together as a church in the Fellowship of the Holy Spirit, uh, bound in the unity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that, we are thankful, Father. We are thankful that we meet in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he has done great things for us, that we have indeed been saved uh, by him, by his sacrifice on the cross for us. So we meet together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're separated, but we're together in that fellowship, in that bond of fellowship that unites us. Father, we do commit this time to you. We pray for a, the help of your Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us in our thoughts this morning. Help us in our worship. Help us to put away distractions, those distractions of our living rooms or our kitchens or wherever we are. Help us to focus on our worship this morning. That that focus of our worship that should be the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we do pray that we might exalt his name. We pray that we might do it aright. And we pray for your help in that. So we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our hymn this morning is one of my favourite morning hymns. It begins, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. This hymn was written by a man called Reginald Heber. If, like me, you um, look at the dates of people's lives given in hymn books and then try and calculate their ages, then you'd find that he died in 1826 at the age of just 42. He had an eventful life. He was from a wealthy background as a young man. He went travelling, but his route had to skirt around the armies of Napoleon, who was conquering much of Europe at the time. So he travelled across Scandinavia and much of Russia. And at one time he travelled 500 miles uh, in the midwinter snow on a sledge from St. Petersburg to Moscow. Well, after his travels he returned home and he inherited an estate and settled down as a respected academic, uh, a clergyman and landowner. At the age of 39, he gave it all up. He'd become fired up by the great commission given to the church by Christ to go into all the world and make disciples. As he wrote in one of his hymns, Can we whose souls are lighted with wisdom from on high, can we to men benighted the lamp of life deny? And he took up an appointment as the Bishop of Calcutta in India and sailed there with his wife and family. Now in those days, to go to India was seen for European people as a virtual death sentence because of the heat and the disease. And many missionaries to India at that time survived only a matter of months or, or even only weeks. Well, in India, he was very energetic. He traveled extensively around the whole of India, going up to the Himalayas, across to Bombay, uh, down into the south and around, even including Ceylon or um, Sri Lanka, as we now call it. 
And in his travels he encouraged local new believers, he set up training colleges, he ordained the first Indian national people into the clergy. And he liked to try and speak the local languages. And he was very popular. Um, but after only three years, he was dead. And he was seen as something of a hero. There are numerous statues of him, including uh, one in St Paul's in London. There were training colleges named after him, but perhaps he would want to remem be remembered best as a hymn writer, writing the words the people of God use to worship their God. And in his life, perhaps we see an echo of the life of his Saviour in leaving riches so that others might become rich. So let's raise our voices together, even if we're in our own homes, and sing together. reasons I like that hymn is that it directs us straight away in our time of worship to the holiness and majesty of God. We're going to turn to our Bibles now and have our Bible reading for this morning. We're taking a break today from Nathan's series in the Gospel of John. I've been doing a series in Hebrews in some of our Sunday evening Zoom meetings and this morning we'll be continuing that series looking at uh, a short section just uh, four verses in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. And our brother Jim is going to read the word of God for us today. Our reading from the Bible today is from Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 12 to 16. For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts 
and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Dear Lord, our loving Heavenly Father, we bow down before you this morning and we give you thanks for all your goodness that you continue to shower upon us. We thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness, for your mercy and for your patience with us. We thank you for your word, Lord, and for what you have read in it this morning. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can draw uh, before your throne of grace and receive grace and receive mercy from you the one true living God that we can find grace and peace at the time of need we thank you Heavenly Father that your word is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword we thank you for these instructions and these helps that we can turn to your word at any time when we're struggling when we're struggling in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ Help us, Lord, to, to look upwards towards him, the author and the finisher of our faith. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for our little church. We, we just really look forward to getting back together, to meeting one another again. Lord, we know that some of us have had uh, meetings and, and contact between each other, recitings during this period of time. And it's been a really joyful thing to do, to just by happenstance to meet one another in the street or on the road. And Lord, we just uh, give you thanks for one another. We would pray for our town, the outlying villages. We pray, Lord, in this, at this time of a pandemic that you might use this fear that people have. And it's a palpable fear. We've seen it. We continue to see it on a, on a daily basis, Lord. People frightened, uh, frightened of the future, not knowing what is going to happen. Just totally uh, totally in, in, in ways that we had never seen before, frightened to death of death itself. And Lord, we just give you thanks for those of us who are saved, that we have this inner peace of knowing that whatever happens, that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and those who are called according to his purposes. And so Lord, we just pray for our town. We pray for those who we have prayed for in the past many times and continue to do so. People who are close to us, people who are relatives that do not know the Saviour as yet. And Lord, we just lay those all before your feet. Lord, we, we, we know that you not, your, your will is not for any to perish, but that all might come to repentance. And Lord, we just give you thanks for the people back in the day, whenever we were, before we were converted, people who perhaps pray for us, parents, grandparents, teachers, Sunday school teachers. Help us, Lord, to realise the real importance that, that prayer is. It is the greatest uh, weapon that we have in our arsenal to deal uh, with Satan and to cry out to you. But, Lord, it's the one that we do not use. We're shamefully, you're all guilty of it. We do not use it uh, as, as much as we should, as much as we ought. We know, Heavenly Father, that your word tells us that we are to, to pray without ceasing. We just pray, Heavenly Father, that you might encourage us by your Holy Spirit to keep those uh, nearest and dearest, those family members and those people that we rub shoulders with at our town in outlying villages. Pray for, this morning for our government and as they struggle to 
to deal with all sorts of things, all sorts of manner of things that they they never expected to uh, come up against. But Lord, this didn't take you by surprise. You knew exactly what was coming. And we pray, Lord, that you may use it for your glory and for for the sweeping of many of our fellow country men and women into the kingdom. Not just here, Lord, but right across the world as this pandemic has gripped people across the world and has shocked them, surprised them, and maybe brought them to a stop of what they were doing and the lifestyle that they were leading. But Lord, it's only you that can convict of sin. It's only the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. And we just ask, Heavenly Father, that, that you may hear and answer our prayers according to your will. Forgive us, Lord, if we're impatient and, and wanting things to happen in our time. But Lord, we know that your timing is perfect. So we give you thanks. We, we thank you, Lord, for keeping us safe and all the members of our church. We do look forward to uh, coming together again soon. We pray, Lord, that you would enable us to do so. We sing your prayers separately, Lord, and in our houses uh, on a Lord's day. And we, we thank you, Lord, for the provision of that and, and how successful it has been. And, and yet many churches across the, the globe have been able to reach out into many homes that were not there before uh, during this pe period of time. And we just give you thanks for it again, Lord, that how you have been able to use this uh, this virus to, to bring people to a halt, to question what they've been doing prior to that. Lord, we just pray that you may continue to do so. We thank you, Lord, for our National Health Service. And we know people have been out clapping and applauding them, but you're the one who has given the man at the start back in the, in the after the Second World War in the 40s the, the vision and the drive and the determination to give us such a wonderful system. Lord, we know it's not perfect, and but we would just ask your blessing upon them. We thank you for the skills and the talents that you have given to doctors and nurses and all manner of folk that work within those that organization. So many different clinics, hospitals, doctors, surgeries up and down our land. We are so blessed, Lord, when we see uh, other lands that have nowhere near the same facilities that we have here. And, and yet, Lord, there are many of our fellow men, countrymen and women who would complain at the drop of a hat at the slightest thing that goes wrong. And yet, Lord, we just are so thankful to you for this wonderful provision. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for our royal family. We, again, Lord, are struggling in the news. We just pray, Lord, for peace for our Queen and her family, Lord. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that all these uh, things that have been uh, upsetting her and, uh, would be contrary to your uh, your rules and your laws if they were all true but lord we've, we're living in a difficult time we're living in a, a world a broken world and we just pray heavenly father that you might in your mercy have mercy upon our land once more we pray lord for our missionaries across the world the ones that we would know and the ones that we support and the ones that we don't know lord again they're struggling in many places with this pandemic and we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless the work of their hands. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you would draw near and let them know you're, you're closest to them. And Lord, we wouldn't leave off our prayer this morning without praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters, especially we think of Nigeria and, and how these lives and have been destroyed since the start of this year, especially, even goes unreported. It must be galling for some of these people to... To, to see, to witness that the lack of interest just in the media of these many lives of, of people in Africa that have been destroyed. We pray again for the, the Chibok girls. They've gone right off the radar. So many evil things have happened in the world since then. We just pray for those girls. Lord, young women now, really. And we would just pray that you would draw near to them and let them know your presence and your closest to them. We think of North Korea and the, the tomfoolery that's going on in that land with the with the president and, and and his sister, Lord. And yet there are so many of our brothers and sisters who who are in dire circumstances in that land. We would just pray again, Lord, 
that you would give them the ability. You give them the, gr the grace to overcome these dreadful persecutions. And Lord, there are many across the world, 50 odd different countries, you know exactly the situation and, and where they are and, and their needs. So here in Ashbourne, in the safety that you have provided for us here in Ashbourne, we just pray that your people across the world might be blessed and they would know, especially on this Lord's Day, your closeness and nearness to them. We ask these things, Father, in and through the mighty name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, our Saviour, our Master, our Redeemer and our Friend. Amen. We're looking at this short passage in Hebrews chapter 4. Just four verses, but four verses which are packed with weighty, dynamic and important truth for us to learn. I'm going to admit that I've shamelessly reused some of the end of my last sermon in Hebrews from a couple of weeks ago. You'll see the reason for that as we go on. I've given this sermon the title Danger, Danger, Danger. Three dangers for us to think about. For some people at least, life seems to be filled with danger right now. In the UK we've just had Super Saturday when after three months of lockdown the pubs and restaurants have been allowed to open and it's been said that we fall into one of three categories. There's one lot of people who can't wait for everything to go back to normal, to go back to socialising, they don't really believe the hype or the, the bad news. And at the other end of the spectrum there's one third uh, or one lot of people anyway who are vulnerable elderly or work in the NHS or, or who have close contact with people who are vulnerable or elderly and, and they can't believe that we're lifting lockdown so easy so early and there's no way they'll be going out socialising and the rest are um, somewhere in the middle and they know it's serious but they're willing to cautiously open up just a bit and slowly so we could say we all have a different perception of danger and it depends at least to some extent on our personal experience and situation. Well, here in our passage today in this section of the Bible, we have three dangers presented to us. We have, firstly, the dangerous word. Secondly, a dangerous place. And thirdly, a dangerous job. Before we get stuck into this section, just let's have a brief look at the background to our passage. Well, the book of Hebrews was written in around AD 60 to 70 to Christians living in Rome who had converted out of Judaism to become Christians. They'd already faced a bout of persecution and now they were facing a new persecution under the Roman Emperor Nero. The Jews in Rome had reached an accommodation with the authorities to avoid persecution so now the temptation facing the Hebrew Christians was this. Is Jesus really worth it? Is being a Christian worth it? And make no mistake, this is a temptation that we all face as Christians at some stage. We will face temptation, disappointment. We will be made glittering offers on one condition. We will face crushing blows the unexplained illnesses of loved ones, accidents which come out of the blue when least expected, the mockery of family, friends, workmates, missing out on the pleasures of this world, promotions. Is Jesus worth it? Is being a Christian worth it? So the writer of the letter to the Hebrews is writing to these Christians to encourage them to stand firm, to continue in their faith, to persevere. And we've said in uh, previous times when we've looked at this book, the overall theme is this. Keep on going. Keep on going by fixing your eyes on Jesus. Now, as we've gone through the early chapters of Hebrews, we've seen the writer take a, a well-argued and logical approach. I'm not going to review those arguments here. I'd normally spend a little bit of time at least going into the context of a particular passage. The passage today quite adequately stands on its own. It's, it's as if the writer has been developing his arguments, but then he turns to 
remind the readers of some standalone, solid, foundational truths, and it's those that we're going to be looking at today. So let's consider our first point, our first danger. And I've said that this is the dangerous word, the dangerous word. When our brother Jim read to us from the King James Version, um, I just want to read to you uh, what it says in uh, a more modern translation, the new King James Version, and this is what it says. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word quick in the New King James Version doesn't mean fast or speedy, but it's an old-fashioned English word. It just means alive or living. We're told six things here about the Word of God, but the first thing we need to ask is, what is the Word of God? And we might be tempted to say, well, this is the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. And yes, it is. But the Bible that we have in our hands today wasn't available to the writer of the letter to the Hebrews or to his readers. They would be much more likely to answer that question by saying that the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible comprising the Torah, the prophets and the writings, what we would call the Old Testament, they would say that that is the Word of God. And in a, a more general sense, we can say that the Word of God is any communication which comes from God. It may be in the form of a prophecy, a commandment, a warning or an encouragement. And the usual formula that we see in the Old Testament was that the, the Word of the Lord came to came to a certain prophet, Isaiah or Jeremiah. And then we get to the New Testament, don't we? The supreme communication of God is in Christ, who in that first chapter of John is referred to as the Word of God. This all ties in with the first verses of Hebrews in chapter 1, in which the writer says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoken time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. So we can say this, the Bible, this book we hold in our hands today, is the Word of God. It's a collection of the words of God that have been recorded in writings that go back three and a half thousand years and which were written down by about 40 or so different authors over a period of about 1500 years. In fact, the word Bible means books. It's almost like a, a library of books. In the first four chapters of Hebrews, the writer has cited the Old Testament 15 times. And in chapter three, in the early part of chapter four, his argument that he's making to his readers, his argument is based on Psalm 95, written hundreds of years before the people of the time. But the readers of his letter might object. They might say, well, Psalm 95 was written hundreds of years ago. Things were different then. What relevance can it possibly have for us living today? We're not in Jerusalem. We're in Rome. We're not Jews. We're Christians and we're facing a persecution under Nero like no one has ever faced before. And of course, that's an objection that we might hear today. You might have thought it yourself, not only about Psalm 95, but about the book of Hebrews and, yes, about the whole of the Bible. This is a very fundamental objection. It has big implications. The big issues that the wider church is facing come down to this issue. How do we view the Bible? In a sense, it's a question that can be asked of every preacher or teacher. Why should we listen to you when what you say is based on a book written 2,000 years ago? How can that be relevant to us today? So what does the writer of the letter to the Hebrews tell us about the word of God? And he tells us six things. Firstly, he says that it's living. It's not dead. It's not a corpse. It's not buried in the ground. It's not relevant only to a time long ago. But how can a book be living? Well, it's living because the God who spoke the word is living. These words that are recorded for us are God's words, spoken 
on his authority, owned by God, purposed by God, and still being used by God for his purposes. One distinctive characteristic of the word of God is that it endures. It's unchanging. Once given, it's not taken back or changed. It cannot return to God unfulfilled. Secondly, it is powerful. It has power. It's not alive, but only just, just hanging on in the terminal ward, depending on life support. The Greek word that's used is a word energes, from which we get our word energy. The word has energy. It's active. It's powerful and active because God is powerful and active. God is still using his word today. It's still relevant. It's still the living and energetic, powerful word of God, which will accomplish that for which he, God, purposes it. Thirdly, the writer gives us a metaphor for the word of God. He says it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Now, this would be a powerful metaphor in a time when a two-edged sword was the most dangerous weapon. Perhaps for us, we would say, what would we say today? A lightsaber. A two-edged sword is it's not like a spear, which only stabs, not like a, an arrow, which only pierces, not like a club, which only stuns. The two-edged sword can pierce with its point and it can cut on every stroke, the forward stroke and the back stroke. And the most, so it's the most dangerous of weapons. But not only that, the writer says that the word of God is sharper than this most dangerous of weapons. Think of a, a sword blade. It would be kept clean and bright, free of rust. They didn't have stainless steel in those days. And before a battle, it would be sharpened, honed, made ready, made ready for the battle. Well, the word of God is more dangerous. It is sharper than a two-edged sword, and it's always ready for battle. We should handle the word of God carefully with respect. We should listen to it carefully with respect. It's dangerous. Fourthly, we're told that it pierces even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And I've combined two of my points there. The writing is, is continuing this sword theme, but this is an unusual sword. It doesn't just produce surface cuts, it goes deep. But more than that, it's very precise. It can divide between joints and marrow. It produces physical division, but more than that, it divides between soul and spirit. It produces spiritual division. Now, when you think about it, this idea of division is quite controversial. Shouldn't the word of God unite us? Haven't we had enough of division, sects, disunity, of everyone having their own interpretation of God's word? There is a division which is biblical and godly. It's the, the division of the sacred from the profane, of good from bad, of true from false, Christian from non-Christian, believer from non-believer, pure from impure, gold from dross, holy from unholy, sanctifying from polluting. Jesus said, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. You can find that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. What was the sword that Jesus came to bring? In the first chapter of Revelation, the Gospel writer John recounts a, a tremendous and powerful vision of Jesus in which he tells us that he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. The sharp two-edged sword. The word of God proceeding from the mouth of Jesus. In the Gospels, Jesus tells stories of division. The sheep and the goats in Matthew chapter 25, the wheat and tares in Matthew 13. Stories ultimately about judgment, a division between those accounted righteous and those not accounted righteous. He tells the story of the wise and foolish builders in Matthew chapter 7. The wise being those who hear Jesus' words and do them, the foolish being those who hear them and don't do them. 
Now there is a handling of the word of God which is incorrect, which does bring division where there should not be any division between Christians. But incorrect handling shouldn't obscure or, or deter the truth of the correct handling of the word, which is to make disciples and to build up and strengthen the church. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul describes the word of God as the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, we see a striking example of the word of God doing its work. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost and a crowd gathers. Peter preaches in the power of the Holy Spirit using, we should note, extensive quotations from the Old Testament. And he finishes by saying, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the book of Acts records the crowd, and it says this, Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. See that work of the sword of the Spirit. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? So that's an example of the sword of the word, the sword of the Spirit, being wielded by the Spirit, doing its work, bringing conviction. Now, just continuing our points, going back to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12. Fifthly, the writer describes the word as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, another word, another translation of the word that's, that's translated here as discerner is judge. The word uncovers our thoughts and intents. Now, there are many today who will sit in judgment on the word of God. They say it's out of date. It needs to be reinterpreted for our society, for our days today. Reinterpreted with inconvenient passages removed. Well, we would reject that view. But as Christians, we need to be careful here. We're quick to criticise non-Christians in how they handle the word of God. But how often are we guilty of being selective in our obedience, of taking seriously those things that are easy for us and conveniently not hearing and not doing those things which challenge us. I'm preaching to myself here. So, the word discerns, judges. But what does it discern or judge? The thoughts of our heart, not just our actions, which everyone sees, known to all. Our very thoughts, those most private thoughts, and our intents, our attitudes, our intentions, plans, our purposes, all assessed and measured against the plumb line of the Word of God. How do we measure up? If we're honest, it's uncomfortable, isn't it? So, that's the first danger, the dangerous word. Let's go on to the second danger, a dangerous place. Verse 13 reads as follows in the New King James Version. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to, we, to whom we must give account. You'll notice in the authorised version that Jim read for us is the God to whom we must, with whom we must do. So in this verse the writer turns from telling us about the word of God to telling us about God himself but the pressure is still on. What he says about God is no less daunting than what he said about the word. He says nothing is hidden from the sight of God, no creature not the lowliest worm, nor the highest president, not the deepest sea creature in the darkness of the Marianas Trench, nor the highest eagle soaring over the Andes, not the smarmiest talk show host, nor the po poorest dweller of a, a sprawling slum, nor the apparently forgotten prisoner in the darkness of a prison cell, all seen, all laid bare, and all to be called to give account. No exceptions, no free passes, no one saying, yes, yes, you're fine, go on through. The word is emphatic, to whom we must 
give account in that older translation, the God with whom we have to do. I wonder if that stops you in your tracks, gives you pause for thought, that there'll come a day when you will stand before God to give account. It's a dangerous place. It should give us pause for thought. It should stop us in our tracks. Perhaps when you think of that dangerous place, you comfort yourself. Well, I'm not the worst. I'm not perfect, but I'm not the worst. Surely God will take into account all the good I've done. It'll all balance up and I'll be OK. That's how so many people think. But God's standard is not our standard. He's the perfect judge whose standard is perfection. And if we miss that standard just once, it's like we've broken all the law. That's just one lie or one stray thought, one flash, flash, flash of unrighteous anger or a, a lustful thought or a covetous thought. And if we're honest, none of us matches up to that standard. I'm not being judgmental. I, I put my hand up. This is me too. We all fall short. We all, you and me, are objects of God's wrath. And that's why this is a dangerous place, a place we will all have to face. And you might say, well, I'm OK, I don't believe it. Well, that's a bit like crossing the road and saying, I won't get run over if I don't believe in that 40 ton truck coming towards me. There is a reality, a true truth that can't be wished away. So what's to be done? As those listeners to Peter on that day of Pentecost said, what shall we do? Well, let's move on to our third danger call it a dangerous job. Verses 14 to 16 direct our thoughts from, from that awful prospect of us having to give account before God. They direct our thoughts to our great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. Now, Jesus is described as the great high priest. In the Old Testament, the high priest was the only person permitted to enter the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, the dwelling place of God among the Israelites. He had to be of a prescribed family. He had to be anointed in a prescribed way. He had to wear prescribed clothing. He had to make prescribed sacrifices on behalf of himself and the people on the day that he was to enter the Holy of Holies. He could only enter on one day, the prescribed day, the Day of Atonement. He entered with the blood of sacrifices. He, he carried in the blood of sacrifices for purification. Now there are instances in the Bible of, peach, a pre, pe, of people approaching God in the wrong way, of being consumed by fire. It was a dangerous job. All of this holds some deep truths for us. The Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place, that tells us that God requires us to set him apart, to keep the things of God special and separate, not part of the common place and every day. God cannot dwell with sinful men and women. There must be a barrier between, a safety barrier, not for his sake, but for our sakes. And the very prescribed nature of the worship tells us that God requires obedience, even in apparently small things. In how we properly worship God, sacrifices had to be made. Literally, there was a whole sacrificial system prescribed. And that sacrificial system required in worship people to irrevocably give up something that was valuable. There was no such thing as cheap or flippant worship. The worship was costly. It's about taking God seriously. And then there is how we are to be forgiven, how our relationship with God is made right. Sacrifices had to be made, but this is now a matter of life and death. There's no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. In the Old Testament, there was a complex system of animal sacrifices, bulls, goats, sheep, doves, to obtain forgiveness and restored relationship. 
These verses, verses 14 to 16, refer to Jesus as the great high priest. He enters God's presence as a high priest and on our behalf. Later in Hebrews, in chapter 9, the writer says that Jesus entered the most holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. What does this mean for us? Well, it's good news. In fact, it's the best news. It affects our here and now in our lives today. It affects our future and ever after, how we face death and beyond. What the Bible is saying is that when Jesus died on the cross, he wasn't just a, a local itinerant preacher caught up in politics th that he didn't understand, someone who was made an example of by the Jewish and Roman authorities. What the Bible is saying is that on the cross, Jesus deliberately offered himself as a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. He could do this because he was the one person, the only person, who had not committed any sin in his life. Just as it says in our passage, he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He didn't have to obtain forgiveness for his own sin. Instead, he could be the perfect sacrifice for sin on our behalf. That was the dangerous job. That was the dangerous place, the cross. That was where Christ went and what he did for us. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah looked forward 600 years to Jesus and he wrote these words. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So does this apply to everyone? Are we all automatically included in this? No. We each need to make a definite decision. We each have to repent and put our trust in Christ. It's not something our parents can do for us. It's not something that is cultural. We're not born Christians. We need to make a definite decision. Nail our colours to the mast, as it were. Say, this is for me. In today's language, we might say, this is where my identity is. This is what I identify with. Now, the first part of this decision is repentance. Repentance is turning around, going in a different direction, putting aside that old thinking that you're good enough to get to heaven, putting aside those wrong thoughts of the character of God, that he's the sort of God who will turn a blind eye to sin, that he's an unjust judge. And the second part of this decision is putting your trust not in yourself, but in Jesus, the Son of God, our great high priest who offered himself as a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. Not sins general, but sins personal, making it personal. He offered himself as a blood sacrifice for my sin and for your sin. Owning that sin, seeing it dealt with, paid for by Jesus on the cross. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter was asked by the crowd what they should do, he said, repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And on that day the Bible records 3,000 people responded to Peter's message, the good news. They each made a definite decision, they each repented and put their trust in Christ. What about you? Have you thought about this? Can I ask you to think about it carefully now? I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for you to subscribe or share. I'm asking you to consider Christ, to consider the character of God, his holiness, the reality of judgment, the goodness of God in sending Christ, the love of Christ in dying for you so that you could be forgiven. 
I don't want you to go away and, and put this to one side to think about later. These are uncertain times. Just down the road from us, the city of Leicester has gone back into lockdown. These really are uncertain times. As the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We spoke about those three categories of people and those different perceptions of danger as we come out of lockdown. What I'm trying to do is just to raise your alert level, not to a danger that might happen, but to a danger that certainly will happen. That's a 100% certainty that it will happen. If you do this, if you make a, a definite decision to repent and put your trust in Christ, then what you will find is that suddenly things change. Your sins will be forgiven. Have you ever experienced the reality of sins forgiven? It's not possible outside of Christ. Your guilt will be taken away. Have you ever experienced the reality of guilt taken away? It's not possible outside of Christ. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll be born again, given a new nature, new relationships with God as father, Jesus as brother and with Christian brothers and sisters, a fellowship which can only be experienced in Christ. The word of God, that dangerous word that we've thought about, is no longer a sword cutting to the heart, but now when you've made that definite decision, it's the God-breathed word, a, a love letter from God, able to make us wise for salvation, for teaching us, rebuking us, correcting us, training us that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, that good work that God has for us to do. And instead of standing alone before God, facing judgment, having to give account that dangerous place, we stand in Christ before God, together with him, with him having borne all of the wrath of God on our behalf. But more than that, Christ makes us right with God, not just forgiven, but seen by God as righteous, pleasing to him. So the writer to the Hebrews can say, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, boldly to the very throne of God, boldly into the Holy of Holies, where the, the Israelite high priest could only go once a year. How can this be? In Christ. In Christ. What a wonder. What a privilege. Are we made perfect in Christ? Well, not, not now, not in this life, but we will be. Are our lives made perfect in Christ? No. Are all our problems solved? No. Are all our prayers answered just as we want? No. But here is the assurance that we have. We have it in our passage. We have a great high priest who was tempted just as we are. He knows our weaknesses. He can sympathise with our weaknesses. So as we use that privilege, that wonderful privilege of coming boldly before the throne of grace, we're promised that in time of need we will obtain mercy and find grace to help. What's mercy? It's not getting what we deserve. What's grace? It's a love that we don't deserve. Grace to help in time of need. What a, what a wonderful thing this is. No longer a dangerous word, but words that will build us up, make us wise and equip us. No longer a dangerous place, but a place where we, we find grace and mercy. A dangerous job, a, a terrible work undertaken for us by Christ that we might come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the immense privilege that we have as believers in being able to come before your throne of grace. We pray for those listening to this message who've not yet made that definite decision to repent and put their trust in Christ, 
you still face the prospect of standing before you in that dangerous place. Please help them to consider carefully the things we have thought about this morning. Please help them to make that definite decision. Please help them to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And for us believers, please build us up and encourage us as we are presently unable to physically meet together. Let us bless each other. And as an act of unity and fellowship, let's finish by praying the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen. That's the end of our service this morning. May God bless you on this day, the Lord's Day, and in the week to come.